The place is Birmingham, Alabama. The date is Good Friday, April 12, 1963. The occasion is the arrest of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., scores of black college students, and other individuals who had begun a series of nonviolent actions, including sit-ins at libraries and lunch counters, kneel-ins by black visitors at white churches, and a march to the county building to begin a voter registration drive. They were charged with parading without a permit. The next day, a full page ad from white, eight white clergymen appeared in the Birmingham News. This open letter entitled, A Call to Unity, strongly urged citizens to not participate in the demonstrations, but to be patient, to engage in dialogue, to pursue rights in courts, and observe law and order. A copy of the newspaper was smuggled into jail to Dr. King. And over a few days, he composed a response known as the letter from a Birmingham city jail, dated April 16, 1963. Dr. King described his writing of the letter as follows. Begun on the margins of the newspaper in which the statement appeared while I was in jail, the letter was continued on scraps of paper and concluded on a writing pad my attorneys were eventually permitted to leave me. Sixty years later, this letter remains a significant document in American history. Today, we present select excerpts of the letter and the historical context that made the letter necessary. The language you will hear in the letter reflects the dialect of the time. Dr. King was released on bond on April 20, 1963, and continued his work as a civil rights leader until he was assassinated five years later. We commemorate his life and legacy today. We hope you will reflect with gratitude on how far we have come and pledge to continue moving forward in faith, in justice, and peace to create the beloved community Dr. King dreamed about. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their dust, saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate 
that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham. But it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. Segregation now, segregation tomorrow. Segregation forever, declared George Wallace in his first speech as governor of Alabama on January 14, 1963. The African Americans in Birmingham, Alabama refused to accept no service or inferior service at restaurants and stores. They could not use public parks, libraries, swimming pools, and had separate schools, bathrooms, and drinking fountains. They demonstrated for change and were beaten, jailed, and lynched. Their homes and churches were bombed. They had had enough. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth invited Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to lend their influence and to lead the Birmingham campaigns for desegregation in the most segregated city in the United States. Together, they challenged the state and city leadership. Following his arrest and the letter that we highlight today, the movement gained momentum and several other significant events occurred in Birmingham in 1963. One demonstration so angered the city councilor that he unleashed violence on unarmed school children they were clubbed by police officers, attacked by police dogs, and fire pressure fire ho high pressure fire hoses. When American and international audiences watched these images on television, they were outraged. Attitudes towards the civil rights movement began to gradually change. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church that killed four little African American girls and injured 20 other persons inside ultimately led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, sex, and national origin. Thank you. There are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gain saying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely open. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? You may well ask, why direct action? Why sittings, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and fosters such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. I must confess, that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, 
But there is a type of constructive, non-violent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for non-violent godflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of Direct Action Program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. In the first half of the 20th century, the American South worked hard to maintain the segregated way of life that reigned over its citizens since the 19th century that embraced not a separate but equal, but a separate and unequal society. The constant use and threat of violence by lawmakers and law enforcement, citizens councils, vigilante groups, and labors in maintaining Jim Crow and the status quo led to an organized, nonviolent, and passive resistant movement against segregation following the Brown decision and the murder of Emmett Till. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. first encountered the concept of nonviolence as an undergraduate at Morehouse College. Having grown up in a segregated Atlanta, Dr. King became fascinated by the idea of refusing to cooperate with an evil system. Later, as a seminary student, Dr. King discovered the works and life and works of Mahatma Gandhi, lawyer, Indian nationalist, and political ethicist, who espoused concepts of love and nonviolence as a force for social change. Dr. King connected Gandhi's words with the words of Jesus to love your enemies and Gandhi's stress on love and nonviolence gave King the method to bring systemic change to the South. Dr. King's adoption of Gandhi's philosophy became a powerful weapon in the struggle for freedom from an institutionalized racial segregation, discrimination, and inequity. Dr. King, steered by his education, theology, and faith, viewed the principle of nonviolence as a guiding force for the civil rights movement. In his words, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation while Gandhi furnished the method. For Dr. King, the nonviolent resistor must have a deep faith in the future, stemming from the conviction that the universe is on the side of justice. For years now, I've heard the word wait. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence. But we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who've never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, 
When you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she's told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconsciousness bitterness toward white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is saying, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of law, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things.
Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound. It is morally wrong and sinful. Let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numerical or power majority group compels a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is difference made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give you another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that, as a result of being denied the right to vote, had no part in enacting or devising the law. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evident sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation. Named after a black minstrel show character, the laws which existed for about 100 years from the post-Civil War era until at least 1968 were meant to marginalize African Americans by denying them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, or other opportunities. Those who attempted to defy Jim Crow laws often faced arrest, fines, jail sentences, violence, and even death. The roots of Jim Crow laws began as early as 1865, immediately following the ratification of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States. 
The law soon spread around the country with even more force than previously. Public parks were forbidden for African Americans to enter, and theaters and restaurants were segregated. Segregated waiting rooms in the bus and train stations were required, as well as water fountains, restrooms, building entrances, elevators, cemeteries, even amusement park cashier windows. Laws forbade African Americans from living in white neighborhoods. Segregation was enforced for public pools, phone booths, hospitals, asylums, jails, and residential homes for the elderly and disabled. The North was not immune to Jim Crow-like laws. Some states required black people to own property before they could vote. Schools and neighborhoods were segregated and businesses in the North displayed whites only signs. Dr. King said this, one is not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it in the open where it can be seen and dealt with. I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces. One is a force of complacency. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred. And it comes perilously close to advocating violence. I have tried to stand between these two forces saying that we need emulate neither the do-nothingness of the complacent nor the hatred and despair of the black nationalist. For there is the more excellent way of love and non-violent protest. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, by now many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. Oppressed people 
cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. And that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. And something without has reminded him that it can be gained. The Negro has many pent up resentments and latent frustrations, and he must release them. So let him march. Let him make per pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you? Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream? Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I made a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below their environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. On behalf of uh, Dean Johnson, the chair of the Martin Luther King Committee, and the Office of Culture and Inclusion and Center for Faith Engagement, we want to thank and recognize uh, Dan Weber, uh, Kristen Denslow, and Rodney Palmer, uh, for their contribution in making this experience possible today and also recognize all the readers uh, and participants today. Let's give them a hand for a moment.
just in just a moment, I'm going to read a collection of prayers for our benediction that Dr. King shared. Following that, you'll be able to look at the screen for a QR code and uh, URL to get the survey to check out. Please stand with me for prayer. Dearest Jesus, come and stand with us today. Show us the lies that are still embedded in the soul of America's consciousness. Unmask the untruths we have made our best friends, for they seek our destruction and we are being destroyed, Lord. Reveal the ways that lies have distorted and destroyed our relationships. They break your shalom daily. Jesus, give us courage to embrace the truth about ourselves and you and our world. Truth, we are all made in your image. Truth, you are God, we are not. You are God, money is not. You are God, jails, bombs, and bullets are not. God, help us as individuals, as in a world, to hear it now before it is too late. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and God's justice and all these other things shall be added unto you. Thou, eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being, we humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls, and minds, and we have not loved our neighbors as Christ loved us. We have all too often lived by our own selfish impulses, rather than by the life of sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in order to receive. We love our friends and hate our enemies. We go the first mile, but dare not travel the second. We forgive, but dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of an eternal revolt against you. But thou, O God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know your will. Give us the courage to do your will. Give us the devotion to love your will. O God, we thank thee for creative insights in the universe. We thank thee for the lives of the great saints and prophets in the past who have revealed to us that we can stand up amid the problems and difficulties and trials of life and not give in. We thank you for our forebearers who've given us something in the midst of the darkness of exploitation and oppression to keep going. And grant that we will go on with proper faith and the proper determination of will so that we will be able to make a creative contribution to this world and in our lives. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen.